All right, another day, another Algebra 2 video. So what we're going to talk about today is factoring polynomials. Now, if you think back way, way to when you first learned about the word factor, um, which is actually probably sooner than you think you've learned it, um, maybe in middle school or even elementary school, remember factors of a value are two things that you can multiply together to get back to that original value. So for example, um, factors of 12 would be 2 and 6 because together they multiply to give you 12, right? So what we're talking about now are factoring polynomials. We did factoring trinomials. Uh, you did in Algebra 1. We did it earlier in this school year. Now we're going to talk about factoring polynomials, meaning we're going to have lots of terms. So what I want you to do right now is pause this video and see if you can remember how to factor these two examples. So the first one is a binomial and the second one is a trinomial. I will go ahead and tell you that the first one only has a GCF and the second one um, you can factor which you've been doing with A, C, and B, all of that good stuff. So pause this video and see if you can remember how to do it. All right. <clears throat> so what I want to do is take a look and see what are common factors, what is the greatest common factor of 21 and 30? Well, I know the factors of 21 are 1 and 21 and 3 and 7. My factors of 30 are 1 and 30, 2 and 15, 3 and 10, and 5 and 6. So I noticed that both of those had a 1 in common and had a 3 in common, but since 3 is the greatest factor that they have in common, I'm going to say that factor out a 3. And then between p cubed and p squared, the greatest common factor, of course, is p squared. And if you don't remember why, it's because p cubed is p times p times p, p squared is p times p, so they have p squared in common. Then I have to figure out, okay, once I factor those out, what is the other factor, right? What do I have to multiply that by to go back to 21p cubed plus 30p squared? So 3 times 7 is 21 because 21 divided by 3 is 7. And p squared times p is p cubed because p cubed divided by p squared is p. And then... 3 times what gives me 30, or vice versa, 30 divided by 3 is positive 10. p squared times 1 is p squared, but I'm not going to write 10 times 1, so I'm just going to leave it just like that. Then you always want to make sure, is this factorable further, okay? And since it's just a p, there's no exponent, there's no GCF, that actually means that I am done factoring that one. Now let's take a look at this one right here. So the first thing, of course, I want to do is make sure, is there a greatest common factor? If there is, I need to factor that out first before I do anything else. 3, negative 8, and 4 do not have any common factors. So what that means is now I'm going to have to factor by grouping. So I'm going to first split up this middle term right here, and I have to figure out what two values were combined to get me negative 8. But remember, there's a special way, negative 8n, remember there's a special way to do that. I'm going to create myself a table, and in that table, I'm trying to figure out a times c that add to b. My a value is 3, my b value is negative 8, and my c value is 4. So that makes a times c 12, that makes b negative 8. So I'm looking for two numbers. When I multiply them, I get 12, but when I add those same two numbers, I get negative 8. And you might be the type of person that has to go down and list all of the factors, and that's okay, okay? It's better to be thorough and get it right than it is to just assume and then get it wrong. So I'm looking for those values. So, of course, I know 1 times 12 is 12, but 1 plus 12 is not negative 8. 2 times 6 is 12, but 2 plus 6 is not negative 8. But you're like, wait a second. 2 plus 6 is positive 8, though, right? So if you get the positive version or the wrong sign of an answer, all you have to do is change the signs on both of your two factors. So positive 2 times positive 6 gives me 12, but hey, you know what? Negative 2 times negative 6 also gives me positive 12. 
but this time negative 2 plus negative 6 is negative 8. And those are the values that go in my two blanks. So I'm going to say negative 2 and negative 6. But remember, we split up a negative 8n, so I need an n right here as well. Once you do that, you're actually going to perform these steps again where I find greatest common factor. But you're, it's called factor by grouping because I'm going to factor them in groups. Wow, go figure. I'm going to factor that. So 3n squared and negative 2n, I've got to go figure out its greatest common factor. And right here, I have to figure out its greatest common factor as well. So 3 and negative 2 only have a common factor of 1. I'm not going to write it down unless I have to. And then n squared and n have an n as a GCF. So n times 3n is 3n squared, and n times negative 2 is negative 2n. And then over here, if this leading coefficient is negative, I always factor out a negative, and then 6n and 4 have a GCF of 2. Negative 2 times 3n is negative 6n, and negative 2 times, be very careful here, negative 2 gives me positive 4. And I know that I'm doing that right because my two parentheses that I've created have naturally been, are naturally the same values, okay? That only happens if you're doing it correct. Don't force it, it's just gonna work out that way. My final answer now is to figure out my actual factors, which are 3n minus 2 times n minus 2. So what that means is when I take these, if I distributed them back, I would end up at the trinomial that I started at. Now, I want to remind you of something that we learned about, not when we were factoring, actually, but when we were learning how to multiply. Because if y'all remember, right, factoring is just taking apart my values and um, multiplying is, well, multiplying them back together. So we're going to actually review something that you learned in a couple of lessons ago, but we're going to go backwards now. And that is special factor patterns. Now, some of these feel overwhelming to a lot of people just because you're not very comfortable with looking at variables like this, but all they are are formulas, right? And these, when you're factoring, are so, so, so valuable. When you're multiplying, it's fine, really, because you can do it the long way. It doesn't really hurt you. But whenever you're factoring, it is so important that you're able to do these because, well, if you look at all of the values that we're factoring, there are two terms, right? But then look at what happens whenever I have factored them out. Um, specifically here, okay? When I try to factor that, check out what happens, right? You don't want to have to do that the long way. So the first one is the difference of perfect squares. So when I look at this right here, I know that it's the difference of perfect squares because obviously x is being squared, but also 16 is a perfect square, right? So whenever you have two perfect squares that are being subtracted, that just changes into that term and that term, but of course they're square roots. So I have x plus four and x minus four because the square root of 16 is four and so I can split it up that way. The sum of perfect cubes and the difference of perfect cubes is next. And again, it's just a formula, right? So I know that this is the sum of perfect cubes because 27 is a perfect cube, x is a perfect, x cubed is a perfect cube, and 8 is a perfect cube. These are things that you should know, okay, especially the first few perfect cubes. And I know that 27 is a perfect cube because 3 cubed is 27, x cubed of course is x cubed, and 2 cubed is 8. So I just plug those values into the formula. Now, the thing here, though, is that when it says a plus b, you're like, well, which of these is the a value and which one of those is the b value? Well, 3 is being cubed and x is being cubed, but that's because the whole thing, 3x, is being cubed, okay? And over here, that's like saying 2 cubed. So 3x is my a and 2 is my b. So that means I've got a plus b which is 3x plus 2. And then a squared, 3x squared is 9x squared. 
minus AB, so minus 3x times 2, AB, which is 6x. Awfully large 6 there. And then 2 plus 2 plus b squared, which is 2. So plus 2 squared, which is 4. And you factored it, right? You're not having to do a long process to do anything like that. And now you can move on to difference of perfect cubes. So same process, except for some of the signs are different. Right here I have minus and plus, whereas here I had plus and minus. So first I've got to go figure out my A and my B value. What value is being cubed to get to 216? That's actually 6. What value is being cubed to get to y cubed? Obviously, that's y. So 6y is cubed here. And then minus, what value is being cubed to get 125? That's a 5. And then x. And so then I just go substitute it into my formula. 6x, sorry, 6y minus 5x. That's my a minus b. Then I have a squared, so I want to do 6y squared. 6 squared is 36, y squared is y squared. Plus ab, so plus 6y times 5x, that's 30xy, or 30yx actually. We should put it in the correct order. And then I have 5x squared. 5 squared is 25, x squared is x squared. And that's it. You've factored all of those. I will say this one shows up so much more than you could even imagine. Knowing that special pattern saves you so much trouble as opposed to having to do it in the long way. Remembering to leave a placeholder for the X makes your job so, so much easier if you just know that one specifically. All right. Now let's go do a couple of examples on what you're going to be expected to do. All right, so there are actually several ways to factor a polynomial. The reason that a lot of kids struggle with factoring polynomials is because there's not necessarily like follow this rule, right? And a lot of times kids are um, very much in this mindset that in math you have to follow these specific rules. And of course there are rules to follow, but there's also a lot of creativity and a lot of um, like puzzle solving and trying to figure out okay, what method should I take in order to make sure that I'm able to do this correctly? And so that's the really cool part about these is that you're going to have to sit and kind of figure out, all right, what method is best for me to use right here? So one way you could do it is by factoring out a common monomial. And you al always need to check this, okay? You always need to make sure, is there a greatest common factor? Factoring out a common monomial is checking, do you have a greatest common factor? So let's take a look at our first example. I've got x cubed, 10x squared, and 24x. The first thing that sticks out to me is that all of those terms have an x. Let me look at their coefficients and see if any of those have common factors. Well, my first term has a coefficient of 1. Nope, not going to worry about it. But I can see that they all have an x as a common monomial. Let's see what's left over. x times x squared gives me x cubed x times 10x gives me 10x squared, and x times 24 gives me 24x. Then you always have to ask yourself, all right, is what's left factorable? Always, always, always ask yourself, is this factorable? Check it, pause this video, check if it's factorable. See if you can find those two numbers. Yes, it is which means you got to keep going, all right? You cannot stop here because you're not fully simplified. You have not fully factored this. So I got to see, all right, I'm looking, because this coefficient is a one, I can factor this a quick way, all right? I've got my X out here already. That's my GCF. And I can say, all right, I know X times X is X squared. This only works. This only works when your leading coefficient for X squared is a one. If you have a leading coefficient of anything other than one, you have to do it where you split up that middle term and you factor by grouping. So I'm looking for two numbers that when I multiply them, I get 24, but when I add them, I get 10. Multiply them to get 24, add them to get 10. Again, the reason this works is because A times C, 24 times one, right? 
Okay, pause this video, find those two numbers. I hope you got four and six. Or you could have done six and four, of course. Since that leading coefficient is one, there's not like any extra steps to take here where you have to factor by grouping and you find the GCF. You are actually done at this point. And I know for sure that I'm done because all of my X values, they're singular X values, okay? All right, next one. Again, factoring out a common monomial. So first thing, what I want you to do is pause this video, see if you can figure out, because there is one, see if you can figure out what the greatest common factor is. All right, so hopefully for the coefficient, you saw that they can, they're both divisible by by five. And for the y's, for the variables, hopefully you realize that it's y to the fourth. Five y to the fourth times y squared is y to the five y to the sixth and then minus 25 because five times 25 is 125 and I've already got my y to the fourth. But now I have to ask myself again, is this factorable? Sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't be. It is, and not only is it factorable, it is one of our special factor um, patterns. Y squared minus 24, Y is a perfect square. Y squared is a perfect square, 25 is a perfect square, and they're being subtracted. So this is the difference of perfect squares. So I can change this into y plus 5, y minus 5. Don't forget to bring down your GCF. That is it. All right, now let's talk about factoring by grouping, where now we have right here, we had a trinomial, we had a binomial. Let's see what happens when we have four terms. You can check if you're supposed to factor by grouping by first, of course, looking at the problem that you're given. And notice that, hey, I can create groups because this is four terms. It's an even number of terms, right? So I can, even though I don't know necessarily how to factor all of them because I don't see anything that they all are divisible by. However, I can see that these two have something that in common that they're divisible by. And I see that these two have something in common that they're divisible by. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to factor what I can. All right, so let's do that. We're going to do the GCF here, and we're going to do the GCF here. So pause this video, see if you can do those two separate GCFs, and of course what's left over in the parentheses. All right, and you've actually already done this process before, right? Whenever you are factoring a trinomial by grouping, it's called factoring by grouping, you do end up with four terms that you do the GCF of each. So. 3y cubed and y squared have a GCF of y squared. 3y is on the inside because y squared times 3y is 3y cubed. Plus, well, I've already got a y squared on the outside. However, I need a value on the inside. You can't just leave it blank like that, okay? y squared times what is y squared? y squared times 1. Now in the second set, 9y and 3. They both are divisible by 3, 3y three plus 1. And hey, would you look at that? Just like before, what's in my parentheses is the same. So just like before, I'm going to say 3y plus 1 and y squared plus 3. And again, just like before, I need to ask myself, can I factor further than this? Is that factorable? And it is not. It's not the sum of two perfect squares. It's not the difference of perfect squares. It's not any, well, there is no such thing as sum of perfect squares. So that tells me we are done. And one more time, pause the video, see if you can do this one on your own. I bet you can, okay? All righty, let's see how you did. 15 and negative 20 have a GCF of 5. X cubed and X squared have a GCF of X squared. 5 times 3 is 15. X squared times X is X cubed minus 4. Now let's do the GCF here. 
Those are both divisible by 4. 4 times 3 is 12. I've already got, I mean, I don't have an x. I need to put it on the inside of my parentheses. Minus 4. Oh my gosh, those are the same, right? So my final answer, of course, is going to be 3x minus 4 times 5x squared plus 4. I didn't check it, but hopefully you did. Make sure that neither of those two um, are factorable. Okay, so you always want to see if you can go any further. All right, and then the last thing we're going to talk about is like a partner of the remainder theorem. Let's see what happens. So we're now determining whether a binomial is a factor of a polynomial. And if you were really paying attention to the remainder theorem, you would have, uh, you would have probably already recognized this, right? It says a polynomial f of x has a factor x minus k if and only if f of k is equal to zero. So think back to the remainder theorem, right? The remainder theorem said that whenever I evaluated my function at k, so when I plugged in that k value, whatever value I got out was the remainder, right? And you only have remainders when things cannot divide evenly into each other. Um, that very first example that we did, where we did 277 divided by 12, we had a remainder of 1 because I need 12 and I only have 1. So when I substitute in a value and I get out a number, that value is the remainder. Well, what if I get out a 0? That tells me that my remainder is 0. And when you have a remainder of 0, that tells me that my values, that they divide evenly. So that's what that factor theorem is saying. If it's equal to zero, there is no remainder, and thus they are divisible, okay? So determine whether x plus 3 is a factor of f of x equals x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus x minus 3. If so, factor it completely. You can determine whether it's a factor one of two ways. You can use the factor theorem and substitute it in, or you can use synthetic division and take a look at that remainder, right? If that remainder is zero, it is a factor. If that remainder is a value, then it's not a factor. I'm going to use the evaluation method. I'm going to substitute in my k value. So I'm going to say, all right, well, I know that k is negative 3. So I'm going to substitute it in. f of negative 3. I hope, 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 hope that I get a 0. Because if it is, I get to factor, my favorite. So negative 3 to the fourth power. Notice how my exponent is on the outside of my parentheses. Very important. Plus 3 times negative 3 to the third power minus negative 3. Notice I have a minus sign and a negative sign. The minus comes from the equation. The negative comes from the value that I'm substituting. Minus 3. Go ahead, pause this video, grab your calculator or your big brain and evaluate. Did you get zero? All right. So it said determine whether x plus 3 is a factor. So I can say, yes, x plus 3 is a factor. OK, then it says, if so, I have to go factor it. OK, so since it's a factor, I know I know that I can divide it evenly, right? So let's take a look at my uh, polynomial that I'm given here. When I take a look at that polynomial, I see that it's, there's four terms. So my first thought is to see if I can factor by grouping. So let me go ahead and rewrite it down. And I'm going to see if I can factor this by grouping. So x to the fourth and 3x to the third. Now, since we said that x plus 3 is a factor, when I'm done, I better have x minus 3 as part of my answer because we said yes, okay? And I'm, I'm factoring it. So if x plus 3 is a factor and my job is to factor it, then that better be part of my answer. Notice x to the fourth plus 3x cubed have x cubed as a GCF. So that means I'm left with x plus 3. And then over here, I'm going to factor out a negative 1 x plus 3. Oh my gosh, it did have it in common. Crazy. It's almost like that's exactly what we said it would happen, right? So then means I'm left with x plus 3, 
x cubed minus 1. But remember what I told you on the front. Remember what I told you on the front. You always want to check if it can be factored further. x plus 3 obviously cannot be factored further. But hey, look at this guy. That is the difference of perfect cubes. Pause this video, see if you can substitute the values into the perfect into the sum the difference of perfect cubes formula. All right, so f of x equals, of course, my x plus 3 does not go away. And my difference of perfect cubes formula says do a minus b first. So in order to do a minus b, you have to first figure out what's a and what's b. A is the value that's being cubed at the beginning, which is x, and b, you're like, wait a second. Oh, negative 1 is a perfect cube? Yeah, it is. Because negative 1 times, or well, 1 is a perfect cube because it's the difference of perfect cube formula. 1 times 1 times 1. Of course it's a perfect cube. So x minus 1. And then I have x squared. Plus it says a, b. So x times 1, which is just x, plus b squared, 1. And Whenever you use any one of those special uh, factor patterns, you don't have to check again because that is fully factorable. Oops, let me make sure I can put my box correct. If this is something you're struggling with, then that just means you need to do more problems with special factor patterns and things like that. Um, but that's all there is to factoring polynomials. You're really just doing a amalgamation of everything that you've learned with factoring and with dividing and with multiplying even, right? putting it all together here. So it really shows you if you know what you're talking about. Um, if you've got any questions, of course, bring them to class. Good luck.